it's it's pee and rain out there today and uh, so I'm not going out of the river <clears throat> so I'll do this from the, the entrance to the cave big day ahead of me today what are we doing today I've got my barn door all the pieces are cut perfect and stained and ready to be assembled together so I'm gonna put my barn one of my, my first barn door I'm gonna put that together which is very exciting for us and as well I have one more wall in the on the uh, west side of the barn I can complete today with stain side. I'm gonna do that. That's two of my tasks for today. Get some videos shared today. We have a whole bunch of people coming over to eat some turkey tonight. It's a Canadian Thanksgiving weekend, I believe. What else? And then uh, same today, I'll pack this thing, this quad and all my gear into my truck. And then I think I'll probably be up at 4.30 in the morning to head on a two hour, almost three hour total, log and road trek to go help some people find and harvest their Roosevelt elk tag, which for me and a couple of my friends I'm gonna go with is pretty exciting. It's exciting just to go find the things and look at them. So I'm gonna be doing a lot of videoing on the mountain tomorrow, rain or shine. So uh, I haven't even a clue what I'm gonna, what's getting read today, I never do. I never do have a clue what's getting shared until we share it here. And um, what else? A couple things I was hoping to tap into, and I want to tap into soon with everybody, because we need the inf input from the people. You know, I mentioned the other day to people who just cannot take the word of tens of thousands of people as true, and I referred to them as losers, and I wasn't using the word losers in an insulting way like it typically is used. It is just a fact of you have lost, you're losing, which makes you a loser. If you have come to this point in your lifetime where no matter who your neighbor is, who the person is, who the kind, honest, hardworking person is that shares with them a factual story of what they, they seen, smelled, and heard, and their brain automatically shuts them off, kicks them to the curb, and automatically labels them as a liar. Instantly, no matter who it is. That, for me, what I observe today is the absolute trait of a complete loser in our community today. You've lost, you're losing. Prove me I'm wrong. And I wish there was some way, I wish there's a recipe is somebody might have something to know to turn those people into winners and in making them become comfortable member of society again of, of their community again where they can trust their family members you know they can trust um, their neighbor their teacher uh, they're, they're, they're good strong hard-working honest people in the community they can trust them you know nobody trusts each other anymore it's absolutely bizarre and that leads into our sixth sense. If we were taught from a young age to stay in tune with our sixth sense, our natural given abilities, you wouldn't have to fear somebody not being truthful with you because you'd be able to pick up on it real quick and you would know, right? Prove me wrong. But I strongly feel it's all been conditioned out of us since we were very young, small children. And getting back to the children topic and realizing more that true change comes with the next generations and that's a proven fact and if you actually do give a shit about creating a better life for the next coming generations you have to teach the children honestly and i was thinking maybe possibly especially once we get this thing going back here is maybe all of you intelligent people out there you aware people maybe we can come up with a list of very important things to teach the children that aren't being taught them today right there's so many things they should be taught to children that are not. Um, so many, if I start cracking that list open right now, because I've been thinking about this morning for some odd reason, it just came across my mind. Uh, I think we should all come together with a list of, of items that should be taught to our children that are not being taught to them. And then hopefully we can reach out to as many people as we can with that list and we can start possibly getting people to focus on that list of lessons to create some serious change for the better. And that change would fight the absolute evil, misleading evil that's going on today. 
Wouldn't that be great? But somebody's got to do it, you guys. Somebody has to do that. And clicking a like button on social media isn't going to do F A. Okay? It's action. We've got to teach the children the right ways. Anyway, let's get back to the word of our people. Share the words of the people, share their knowledge, and continue to create this great change that we are doing together, all right? All right, what do we got? Uh, this is titled, Not Sure. <laughs> Perfect, because none of us are, all of us are not sure. Hello, Steve, I'm a Kansas born and raised lady. I heard the story from Arlington, Kansas. I live 10 miles from there. So here are my stories, 2011. Was on the Santa Fe Trail tour in our car, in our car. My mom and I heard a farmer's field that had a fort on it at one time. My mom and I heard of a farmer's field that had a fort on it at one time. Well, we get there and there's just a field. So we walked to the river about a quarter mile. I thought, I thought it strange there were no sounds at the river except the water. Surrounded by trees, I was creeped out and started back up the road. My boyfriend caught up and we were chatting. Steve, in the field coming from the river was a huge black wolf. I know it's not possible. It was running on all fours and was at least up to my chest. I'm 5'9 and this thing was fast. The hair was long. The tail was as long as the body, huge head. It never even looked our way. My boyfriend didn't see it and there was no sounds. And Steve, it disappeared when I got to the, it disappeared when it got to the end of the field. My boyfriend said I was crazy. I know what I saw and I know it's not possible. The next field was just dirt. I'm still confused at what I saw. 2013, Walnut, Mississippi. Was transferred there for six months. Found a trailer house about 10 miles out of town. Very rural for me. My house was surrounded by trees you couldn't see through. Never felt good there. I was always creeped out. So I started walking. Every day I walked. Two months in, I was walking up my usual path of road and there was something paralleling me, but it's impossible to see. The woods are so black. Then the stick started falling a few feet in front of me. That never happened before. I never heard anything but the footsteps. But how is that possible with all the trees, I thought to myself. Then one of the sticks started moving. Oh my God. It looked like just a stick, but was moving. I think it was a snake, but I didn't care. I turned around and walked home. Never heard this, never heard the walking in the woods on my way back, but I swear it lived behind my house. Thank you for letting me tell my story, Christina Roberts. Christina, thanks for that email. You're not the first person to share with everybody about the huge wolf. Um, the sticks, I don't know what to say about that. Um, you know as well as I do, after you're listening to everybody here, that the, uh, the footsteps have been it's dozens, dozens and dozens of times the footstep thing going on, paralleling us in the woods. It's a shitty deal. <clears throat> but the big black wolf up to your chest, I have had so many people email in a, uh, a large canine, a large wolf, like huge. Had a guy, a guy emailed in, I don't think I've even shared the email yet. A guy emailed in from northwestern BC of seeing one of those things basically just calmly walking right across in front of him, in front of his vehicle, and the back was over the hood of his vehicle. Same thing, monstrous sized wolf. He said it didn't even look at him, just carried on. And that's some alarming shit. All right, you get a pack of those things, what could they do? Not assuming that everything's in, everything is evil and out to get us, but we as simple human beings, we got to, uh, we have to know what's going on out there, man. So, so we can somewhat deal with it. But I have no explanations for the large wolf sightings myself. I've heard of them dozens of times. I am absolutely familiar with wolves myself. I probably had my hands on over 200 of them. And uh, wolves, just so you know, your average wolf, your average timber wolf is very, very tall. They're a very long-legged, very lean animal. And your average wolf is around 80, we'll even call it 70, probably even 60. We'll say 
70 to 85 pounds. That's your average mature timber wolf weight. Um, out of all the wolves that I've had my hands on, I believe the largest one I ever had my hands on was 129 pounds. That was a bruiser. I've seen pictures of some absolute abnormal sized wolves. An old trapper in northern British Columbia at a remote gas stop, stop and he showed me a picture. He claims a 250 pound wolf. Many people have said, not a freaking chance. I saw the picture. He was standing beside it. The man is about six foot four. This thing was hanging from its, from its rear ankles. I mean, its rear leg joint. It was hanging from the rafters in his garage at the elbows, the rear elbows. And that thing's neck and head were, were on, laying on the concrete beside him. That guy was six four. I've never seen any, and that man was probably 200, and, I don't know, he had to been at least been a 225, 30 pound guy. That wolf made him look like a kid. I couldn't believe my eyeballs, but I've seen it. And, uh, but it's just like anything else. There's always gonna be that freak of nature in every species, including human beings. You're always gonna get that one or two genetically altered, not altered, but genetically different specimen of each species. Now, uh, something like what you described, that is ridiculously huge, especially with it disappearing. That might go along with the possibility that we have a parallel, something paralleling our existence that we cannot see, some of us can, some of us can't. There's a huge, huge probability that that's what's going on. But anyway, here I am again, morning time, two coffees. <laughs> High energy. Let's go on some more of these shares. Thanks for sending that in. Keep us posted on anything else you learn, all right? And, uh, and be safe out there. Mark says, Red Sabe subject progressing fast. Hello, Steve. Really appreciate the time you put in for the many people. The world sure could do the more like you. Thanks for the kind words. If you have time, I'd like to share some thoughts, theories, and observations that may help fill the puzzle or confuse it, but also ask some questions of you and this growing round table of thinkers. The topic sure has come a long way in a short period, thanks to the people like you, Steve. So what may we discover next? I recently heard yet another report from North America in which a witness described hearing the creature say, Yahoo! In Australia, before the white man popularized the term Yowie, another term for these beings dating back to the 1800s or earlier was Yahoo. As these beings have also been heard in Australia on many occasions saying this very word. This may start to lead to huge implications if these beings actually share the same language across the globe, unlike human language that changes from land to land, i.e. Could this be a form of confirmation that these beings were indeed here as one culture, one language before our land mass separated? Or maybe that these beings all come from the same location? Perhaps something even deeper, such as their ability to traverse across the globe at will and communicate with other Sabe beings. Oddly enough, we humans can travel the globe by plane, but we still hold on to separate languages. But for how long? Now onto the hair on these beings, and in particular the strange white Sabe sighting in Pennsylvania. Some tests reported the hair to be somewhat translucent and similar to a spider web. Sometimes visible, sometimes not, depending on the light and the angle. I would theorize that their hair, whether it be black, brown, orange, red, or even blonde, is intentionally designed to be best suited to the timber or environment around them. But who honestly knows? Perhaps amongst much phenomena, they could also change hair color and bend light spectrums at will. In Australia, there is a diverse mixture of red and white bark eucalyptus trees, as well as black woods. So naturally, like North America, there are sightings with an assortment of hair colors. So back to the white Sabbath. Was it a hoax or was it snow season in Pennsylvania at the time? How come you never see a white one in a dark forest? Please share your thoughts. On the subject of telepathy, not having had an experience myself, who am I to judge? I do often wonder though, if this is actually some voice deeply embedded in our DNA speaking to us or actually these beings. If all Sabe have these telepathic abilities, I wonder why we would hear tree knocks, whistles, and gibberish when they just communicate with each other telepathically. I also have a hard time believing these creatures just want to be left alone. Just like us or any life form, the greater the intelligence, the greater the curiosity. Humans are usually bunkered down at night and therefore they often come to us 
and our campsite or home on their terms. They would not do this if they wanted to be left alone. During the day, however, humans are on the move and an encounter is often us impeding or catching them off guard. Therefore, generally a sighting during the day is of them fleeing. As a hunter slash fisher, I also don't buy into the daytime is ours, nighttime is theirs train of thought. I go where I want, when I want, according to my prey, and how it reacts to the moon phase, barometer, weather, etc. To reiterate your message, Steve, we were born here, not our choice, it's our environment too. And to add to that, we are not born with fear either. Instead of teaching us the possibilities of bending objects with nothing but the mind, we are programmed to fear the very environment we are designed intentionally to survive and flourish. I'll wrap it up on this thought, Steve. I understand your bewilderment when it comes to people having a 30 cal rifle or bigger and not wanting to shoot, thinking it'll do nothing. I appreciate that sheer size of these beings command respect. What we all must also appreciate though is while physically we are much smaller and knowing the crazy power these beings have demonstrated, it begs the question, why don't they just grab us and crush us at any given opportunity? Why not? There has got to be something about us that literally scares the shit out of these beings. Probably explains why some people experience a rotten smell or strong sulfuric urine smell, lol. Perhaps they know something about our capabilities that we have long forgotten. Perhaps they just don't know what technology we are going to point at them next. I'll leave it there for now. Thanks for your time, Steve, and take care, everyone. Scott. All right, Scott, thanks for sending that in. Gets the wheels turning, opens up a lot of discussion, right? Where do we start to address that one? Uh, hair, hair color and location. Um, I haven't put that much thought into the hair color location of these beings myself. Why? Because for me personally, and I can't dictate this as fact because it's still a missing, there's a few pieces missing to my puzzle. Um, one incident that stands out to my mind and really took me back and made me think about it way back when I first heard it was when some guys in north eastern British Columbia during the middle of winter, minus 40, minus 30s, they were stuck up on the, I think it was either a drilling platform in the oil field on a lease, so a lease is like a big square cutout where all the timber's gone, they pile up the gravel, they got the, the well in the middle of that thing and it's typically in the middle of nowhere. And uh, these guys were working, it was dark, it was nighttime, and these two guys climbed up the tower. I'm pretty sure it was one of those towers with the flames burning off of it actually. And you can see those for literally miles all over Northern British Columbia, Alberta, even into the Northwest Territories, all the oil, the oil, uh, oil field construction, all the oil field leases. And uh, you can see those things, a great big Roman candle way off in the distance. If you drive the Alaska Highway at nighttime, once you get past Fort St. John, you'll see these things in the distance burning all over the place. It's nothing new is what I'm getting at. And they said this nine to 10 foot tall creature came out of the timber and was staring at them lit up by the lights on the, on the lease. And these guys obviously shit themselves, climbed up the tower to get to safety. And they were stuck up there for hours. And this thing kept on walking all the way around the lease, just staring up at them. And I would squat down and sit there and stare up, up at them. And from the description of that, I was thinking, that thing was absolutely amazed. It had never even seen that. It probably hit by the, from what I felt, what I thought initially was, that thing had never even seen something like that ever before and was absolutely amazed, taken back, curious, couldn't not sit there and look up and stare at that flame shooting out of the top of that tower and those two humanoid things sitting there looking back at it, scared shitless. And when I was pipelining, working on the pipeline up there during the winter, I remember the welder I was working with, he was there, he was up there when that went down and he said there was a huge buzz. He said all the news, a whole bunch of news, um, news uh, crews were up there, including the National Enquirer went all the way up there, <laughs> right, to report on this and get the scoop. And he said he remembers vividly that when that went down and it was not uh, just a, a, a story. So uh, that, that particular incident is what kicked my brain off thinking, holy shit, these things aren't here full time. That's what I pop. That's, that's where I'm leaning. I'm leaning towards 
these things aren't here full time. And I have ever since that particular experience that I heard of, right? I mean, if that thing had been in the north at any amount of given time, especially where that particular spot was, it had already walked by dozens of those leases and dozens of those towers with the flames shooting out of them at nighttime. It's already seen dozens of them. Why would all of a sudden it be in the middle of the north, the northeast of BC, Alberta, northwest Alberta, and, uh, and be taken back and amazed by what it's looking at? Right? So uh, that is probably why I don't really find the particular hair color overly concerning to myself. But who am I? Um, as far as us being from the planet and not being scared, we're born not scared. Um, I'll attach, I probably forgot a bunch of your email already, but I'll tap into that. Um, years ago, years ago, I was watching a show by complete fluke, and it was a show, it was doing a study on how they proved that experiences a mother has in life and especially emotional episodes are passed down to the baby while it's still inside the womb and it was a very amazing show and it also helped me with what I do is I am a hunter-gatherer because the example they used was when the Great Wall was up in Germany divided the country where that wall tapered off into rural in the middle of nowhere it turned into a hot electric fence going through the the forest for miles and miles and miles and how they proved and backed up that fact where they proved that um, upsetting emotionally emotional um, traumatic episodes that happened with the mother passed down to that infant as knowledge passed on they showed that the red deer they were living in those forests they obviously naturally avoided that hot fence through the forest right and I believe it was two three, maybe even four generations of deer that were born after that wall had been taken down still avoided the, where the big, huge wall, the electric fence was. They still avoided it. Two, three, four generations later, it's passed on down. So, um, I believe that we are born scared naturally for reasons, for, for survival, right? Another thing too is children Humans, we are naturally scared of spiders, a lot of us. Naturally scared of snakes, a lot of us, right? I think that's a built-in survival fear that's naturally put into us. So I, I do believe that we naturally are born with fear, uh, myself, because if we weren't, we possibly wouldn't be uh, existing as a species too long, right? But anyway, interesting, I'm sure everybody else I'm gonna, I gotta get on making more shares. We could probably, I could probably talk on and on and on about your, uh, with your email for sure. And I'm sure your email has everybody thinking and discussing and looking at possibilities, which is what we're trying to get done here, right? Thanks for sounding in, man. And, uh, we're gonna get some real good discussions going back here when this, when this room's done as well. We'll, we'll. we'll crack that open and more soon. What do we got? All right, Australian Yowies. <clears throat> G'day, Steve. Every Aboriginal tribe on the east coast of Australia had a different name for these beings. Tribes in my area knew them as Junjuren and Dulaga. My first encounter was three years ago in the New South Wales Central Highlands. Mate and I were camped in a large clearing along a storm creek. First night was uneventful. Plenty of kangaroos, wallabies, and rabbits and possums around. Night two, no wildlife, and about 10 p.m. something was throwing heavy timber around about 200 meters down the creek. Anyone who has heard large logs bouncing off rocks would recognize this instantly. This went on for five minutes and we both said, what the up is that, before jumping into our swags. Night three, early dinner. My mate was in his swag asleep at 8 p.m. So I'm guessing slags off his sleeping bag to you North Americans. It's definitely quiet, no wildlife again. Two minutes later, it began. I can't say I felt threatened or scared, but the vocalization started in the creek. The only thing I compare it with was the old samurai movies, except it was like there were three pitches all being vocalized at once. It only lasted for about 15 seconds, but I strained my ears to hear more. None came. I didn't sleep much that night. Night four, all the wildlife returned. 
My second encounter is ongoing and borders on harassment. I have a large council reserve 15 minutes from my home. It covers approximately 10 square kilometers of parklands and areas of dense brushland and is locked to the public from dusk till dawn. You can actually see the Sydney CBD from there at night due to work and family commitments. My only time I can go there coin detecting is after 8 p.m. I always had the feeling of being watched here. Some nights way worse than others. And you always knew it was going to be one of those nights when all the possums were high in the trees instead of digging grubs in the ground. Back in April, I was detecting, a po I was detecting opposite a large area of coastal palms and tea tree. It was close to midnight when my ears lit up with this ultra high pitch frequency. I could feel it rattling my brain. I froze and said out loud, that shit won't work on me. I must have pissed Dulaga right off because he struck a tree so hard, I actually ducked. I'm six foot five and 250, and there's no way I could make a noise like that tree strike. I walked out fast and didn't go back for three weeks. The next few times I did your trick, Steve, and I said out loud, I'm here to find some coins. I don't want to film you, and I'll leave you in a few hours. It seemed to work until three weeks ago. All was good until about 11 p.m. Then this long drawn out feminine wail sent me power walking out. I can't go back now. My family and friends think I'm nuts. Even my own mum laughed when I told her. Thanks for letting me share Adam. Adam, that's the way it goes, man. And like I said before, when people laugh, they are scared. I don't care what anybody says. I am 100% con convinced for me that as soon as people laugh at somebody sharing these experiences, it scares the shit out of them. And that's why they laugh. Because believe me, if somebody comes up to anybody and says, hey man, I heard something beating on a tree last night and only an excavator could do it. There's no comedy in that. There's not one word in there of the delivery that will make you laugh. Nothing. But being scared makes us laugh, right? Having a blast, a shot of adrenaline makes us laugh, laugh right away. Being scared makes human beings knee-jerk laugh. Quite often. So, have patience with the people who laugh at you, but at least you were honest and you told them straight up, they got their warnings, right? I had a handful of people laugh at me one time. We were drifting down the river in my drift boat, drift fishing for steelhead on the San Juan River, remote, which dumps into Port Renfrew, west coast of Vancouver Brown, where there are still lots of sightings today. And I brought the topic up. All three guys were laughing at me and making jokes about it the whole way down. But it's winter time, so it gets dark early. By the time we got to the end of the drift, <clears throat> we had to walk from the edge of the river through that dense canopy of huge cedars, so it's basically pitch black. We had to walk all the way out to the main logging road where my pickup truck was parked. And uh, I don't know, it probably would have been about maybe 100 yards. Okay, 100 yards to walk to get to the truck. And there was, at the edge of the river was a root ball, a, a tree, a log with its roots on it, laying on the side of the river. So I said, okay, smart asses, I'll tell you what, you guys think it's a big joke? Um, this is what we're gonna do, because it was really getting dark. I go, I got a pen and paper, let's all, uh, you got to write your name on a piece of paper, stick it on the root ball, we're gonna go to the truck, and each one of you has to take a turn to walk all the way back here in the dark by yourself, get your name tag, and walk back to the truck. All three of them went, not a chance. <laughs> Right, all three of those big tough guys who laughed at me and this subject were shitting themselves and would not walk a hundred yards in the dark by themselves to go get their name on a piece of paper off that root ball back to the truck. Why not? Something gonna get you? Something that doesn't exist running around in the forest that's, that's laughable, right? And that just showed me that all three of them, it made them, the topic made them feel very secure. The best way they, way they could avoid that topic and not be forced to accepting it as real is just to laugh it off. Laugh it off, it'll go away. Right? And deep down, they knew I was serious, they knew I wasn't lying, and I was telling them the truth. But they don't want nothing to do with it. Which is fine. Right? Which is fine. So to all you people out there, as long as you speak openly and honestly, you did your part. Whether you get laughed at or not, well, it's up to them. Take it. Take from it what you will or leave it, right? But at least you did your part and you were honest. You gave them the heads up. What more can you do? All right. Who else needs to be heard this morning besides thousands? There we go. Boom. Mark, this is red. 
Sasquatch sighting 1977, APGMD US Army Military Base. Here we go. Hey Steve, big thank yous to you and all who share their encounters. I've been wanting to send this for a long time. That sucks. Succinctness is not my strong suit. So I keep putting it off. Well, here I go. All right, thank you for writing that in. To my sighting, 1977, I was 11, and I lived on the military base at Aberdeen Proving Ground in Maryland. We lived at the end of post. We're about a half a mile of woods behind our houses emptied into Chesapeake Bay Tidal Inlets, or the open bay. Behind my house was a lone, then 30 feet of grass, then wood line. Oh, a lane, sorry. Behind my house was a lane, then 30 feet of grass, then the wood line. Our garage was on the grass strip, the woods behind it. It was fall and dark after dinner, and I had to put my bike away in the garage. I put my bike in, closed the doors, and as I was closing the padlock, I kind of felt, I felt kind of creeped out. I walked across the lane to our back sidewalk when I saw something moving behind an old wood pile at the woods edge, to the right of the garage about 40 feet or so. Our back porch light was on, so I couldn't see clearly, but it looked like a tall person was hunched over looking at me. The corner of the wood pile was about as tall as me, around five feet. I thought it was this eighth grade boy from down the street who always teased everyone. He was pretty tall. His whole family were super tall of Nordic descent. I yelled, hey, Fungi. I won't explain that nickname, LOL. I see you, stop trying to scare me. The figure then, then withdrew into the woods without making a sound, which I thought was weird. I then ran in the house and told my brother that someone was behind the wood pile and went in the woods. Next morning, we caught the bus at 6 a.m. and went to private Catholic schools that were about an hour away. The bus pulled out of our loop road onto the main road and had to stop as they were doing some kind of road work. Sitting on the right side of the bus and looking out the window, I could see through an opening in the woods down into a tidal inlet. The inlet sits about 50 feet or so below surrounding land and elevation. The inlet is shaped like an arrowhead. I was viewing it from the tip of said arrowhead. This inlet was probably as large as four or five football fields. I saw a large creature walking down the center of the inlet. It's back to me. It was walking along in the direction of the open bay. I had no doubt what I was seeing. It looked dark brown, but overall also gray, like the hair was tipped with gray all over. Over the years, this puzzled me, as I had no idea where the gray Sasquatches, there were gray Sasquatches until the internet age. I viewed the creature for probably 10 seconds, then the bus began, began to pull away. I went up to my brother in front and told him what I saw. I believe the woodpile event that night before was related. I saw Fungi the next day, and he swore he wasn't out the previous evening. And for those who think I may have saw someone in a ghillie suit, not possible. Aberdeen Proving Ground is just that, a proving ground for ballistics, munitions, and heaven only knows what else. People aren't out hunting, especially around Officer's Row or anywhere on that post. Over the years, I've talked about big butts with anyone who was game, and I've heard a few stories of people's encounters in Maryland, specifically Harford County, which borders York. C-O-P-A, by the way. Oh, York County. Pennsylvania, by the way. I've been living in Vermont for the last 25 years. Shout out, blank, blank, and never noticed tree structures here in the Mad River Valley. And began noticing tree structures here in the Mad River Valley, and quite frankly, all over Vermont. I live about 30 minutes north of blank, blank, and even sent them photo, some photos of some. Hey, just so you know, uh, when you, some of these names that get mentioned, including those two, you should, those two that you just mentioned, I don't promote them. And uh, those two names are actually on a list of people who uh, absolutely went out of their way to attack me and try to discredit my character nonstop. And uh, so there you go. That's why I left those names out, okay? I don't promote the douchebags. Like you, Steve, I have absolutely no interest in searching for these creatures, although I cannot help but see their sign or signs of the others. Who knows? I'm a Christian, and I've had a few supernatural events in my life age three and age 11, where I woke to a large, dark, bigger like Sasquatch at my bedside? Weird. I have no desire to open myself to this beyond what I can't help but see. Shout out Scott Carpenter. 
I'm a horticulturist with a fine gardening business here in the valley and many of my clients' homes are up on the mountainsides. I've had a few strange events at one account and some others, but this is already too long. Sorry, not sorry. Suffice to say, I believe they know when you know something's up. I could ruminate for hours. Blessings to you, sir, and all your love and all who you love and hold dear. Many, many thanks for all you do on this topic, as well as the current global situation. Prayers, Jen Grant Malinowski. P.S. Britannia title flat. We kids played in the woods and down along the banks all year long. Huge two to three foot carp would come into the flats to feed at high tide, then leave as the tide went out. Sometimes we'd get stuck and we would free them. It was low tide when I saw the Sasquatch. No human could walk in that mud, believe me. We sunk to our knees once or twice and knew to stay away from most areas, unless you wanted to explain to your parents why you lost another pair of shoes. How a huge Sasquatch could walk in that inlet at their weight and not sink is beyond me. But I know what I saw, and that thing was walking straight down the middle. Super weird. Okay, bye. All right. And there's another one. By a U.S. military base. Common. And another one, and another one, and another one. Thanks for sending that in, Jennifer. We absolutely appreciate it. Let me get one more out, and then I gotta get to work. I'm gonna be in big trouble if I don't get this shit done before all these people get here. All right, time to share my story. Yes, it is. I've fallen at tough times in my late teens to early 20s and found myself homeless. After my parents split, my mother remarried. I grew up in a fairly suburban town in Connecticut, not one you'd expect to find Sasquatch. My childhood home sat abandoned, and I went there seeking shelter and comfort. I sat on the front porch a few hours resting my eyes when the all too familiar Officer Wagner showed with his goons. After some heated words, they told me they had been called by my neighbors. They contacted my father to ask about whether the property was still ours or if I was trespassing. He told them it was okay with him that I was there. We spoke and he agreed to come let me in the empty house as he now only lived a few towns away. I felt betrayed by everyone, especially my neighbors, and spent literally at least the next five hours cussing out and antagonizing them at the top of my lungs from inside the house, half hoping the police would come back. I'm not proud of any of this, but you have to understand, I have always been quite sensitive and felt a combination of anger, hopelessness, sadness, fear, and defeat. Considering I had once been an Olympic-level athlete at the age of 15, chosen to play in the Gathaya Youth World Cup in Gothenburg, Sweden, representing the U.S. Yet here I was watching my life fall apart and I was ready to dish out some of this pain that I felt undeserving of. Although I knew the chicken shit neighborhood would never have it out with me face to face. Hey man, I can completely relate. I can completely relate. The sun went down and laid there on my recently deceased grandfather's couch. The only piece of furniture still in the house when I noticed a pair of yellow eyes looking at me from in between the shutters. Maybe a foot from the ceiling. My whole body tingled and not a, in a good way. As I started to drip sweat, frozen in fear, I'm not sure for how long I remained there looking at me. I didn't move until I fell asleep. When I woke in the morning, I went up to the side of the house where I saw the thing and realized that whatever it was had to be at least eight to nine feet tall. My yard at that side was at a fairly good slope and I was standing at six feet tall. I couldn't reach the spot where its eyes peered through the shutters. I also noticed a large spot of matted down grass a few yards from the window as if something had been laying there. I feel as though I've had a few other experiences and my subconscious won't let me remember. I get the feeling this may be true for lots of people. No doubt. And I hope you survived your uh, grief Sounds like he did, and uh, overcame all the grief that was dropped onto you without you asking for it, right? It's typical of a lot of families that get ripped apart. And that happened to me too, man. Both of my parents brought some very toxic people into our lives as children. We had no choice about it whatsoever. And, uh, and a, lot of, a lot of real nasty shit came from the results of that. So you're not alone, it happens to many, many people out there. But the, the key to surviving it all is to learn how to, is just to learn who you come across in the world is either good or bad for you and to learn to stay away from those who are bad for you and to make sure that you win 
by creating success, becoming better. That's how you win. That's how I won. You become, but first you gotta survive that anger stage when you're young and you don't know what's going on. And uh, you feel like you're worthless, you don't count, and uh, you're angry for a lot of the shitty things that happen to you and you start lashing out. And I completely understand where you were, all right? I did a lot of lashing out. I did a lot of looking for bullies when I was younger. I'm, I'm gonna share some stories with you guys later so you understand. But the key to success for all you people out there who may be in that same position of unfortunately coming from a destroyed family and having very toxic, nasty people brought into your life is to make sure that you become better than all of them. That's the key, you become better. You, you annihilate them with your success. That's what you do, all right? Make sure you do that. You don't turn to drugs and booze and partying and, and just destroying yourself. You don't do it. Anyway, thanks for that share. Uh, you know what you saw. If you didn't see that, you wouldn't be emailing me here today to share with all the people, right? So, I hope, I hope everything is going awesome for you. Currently, right now, today. Anyway, I gotta get going. I got, I got the stuff I gotta do. <laughs> but I'm gonna make a share before I go, another one. And, and post it up so it preloads. So you guys got more. I'm getting more voices heard while I'm out there in the middle of nowhere looking for elk in the monsoon rains. Can't wait. <laughs> Be safe out there, you guys.